that's the sound of what Berliners call the wall woodpeckers. The young men and little boys who arm themselves with hammers and chisels and chip away at the Berlin Wall. They've been at it since November. The past is up for grabs, sold off as souvenirs. And as they chip away, they're not just destroying the past, they're opening up a whole new landscape. Imagine you'd lived in your flat for years and suddenly you realize there's a series of doors you haven't, haven't seen before. You just walk past it again and again, you didn't see them. And suddenly you're there and you start opening them and you see different rooms, new rooms that in a way belong to your flat. Suddenly all around you opens up a new country, a country which hasn't been there for you. For me, it's very strange. I never actually missed West Berlin. I didn't know it before. And, uh, you know, I, it's hard to explain. For me, it was just over. There was, you know, the wall was the end, and I never, I never questioned it in a way. I was surprised that it is one city. I never realized, but if you look at the houses, and the people are the same. I mean, the Berliners, you know, they're rough, they're tough, they're not too friendly, they're real city people. So I think we, I have to learn just going to West Berlin. But at this moment, when the wall is being destroyed, people are beginning to ask what needs to be remembered. Peter Schneider's novel, The Wall Jumper, is in my view the best book about the Berlin Wall. The attractive side of West Berlin for me and for many other writers and intellectuals was this post-war smell of West Berlin. You still felt that there was a car in the middle of the city. This was uh, the, the wall. And the wall was a reminder of that something terrible had happened with the Germans. They um, had let it happen and that something was not really dealt with or something was not over. There was a past that was not uh, over. And you wouldn't feel that in West Germany. Uh, I always felt this wrong completeness of Frankfurt, Munich, and Hamburg. And uh, I rather liked this divided city, this half of something. On any journey through Berlin, it makes sense to start at a place which has been continually in transit, in a wasteland at the center of the city. The Potsdamer Platz used to be the busiest traffic junction in Berlin, perhaps even in Central Europe. Oskar Kokoschka came from Vienna, stopped, stared, and was almost run over. In the 1920s, it became the symbol of the chaos and the momentum of the modern city. Now, it's a barren wasteland, littered with rabbit droppings, a no-man's land several hundred yards across where the wall used to be. But as so often in Berlin, even the emptiness is eloquent. This emptiness, like the city's old buildings, the ruined churches, even the brash cafes, expresses layer upon layer of the past. And what's extraordinary about Berlin is that one layer never seems wholly to conceal another, and times of crisis, like the present, lay bare the past all over again. Historian Michael Cullen is actively involved in deciding the city's future, but the past is sometimes in his way. In the middle of Potsdamer Platz is a small green mound. This is where the Third Reich ended, in Hitler's bunker. That green mound is going to be difficult to get away no matter what you do with it and we have a lot of problems with it i mean the, the bunker is very very big it has walls which are at least four, five or six feet thick it can't be destroyed it can't be dynamited and on the other hand you don't want to make a place of pilgrimage for the never say no or never say die types who would uh, if they could find a way to go into it would probably put bouquets of flowers on the thing it's a big problem. It's impossible to build on it. It's, it's not safe. Uh, to build around it means that you sort of respect it in a certain way. To make a memorial out of it means, uh, well, that's not the right thing to do. We're not quite sure, but it has to be discussed out in public in the next few months. Around the bunker, there's a landscape of piles of rubble, mounds of bricks, and at the edge of the emptiness, 
a little hut. Gunter Kernan is director of the House of World Cultures, a few hundred yards from here. It's a site that's called uh, Topography of Terror, and it's the, the former headquarters of the Gestapo here in Berlin, the, the famous or infamous, really, Prince Albrecht building, which used to be still here right after the war. It wasn't totally destroyed. It was pulled down in the late 40s, really, uh, when people were inclined to forget things and thought by flattening buildings and, and other rather bad memories they could forget. Uh, and it was unearthed again in, I believe, in in honor of the 750th anniversary of the city of Berlin. And uh, all this pain and suffering, all that's left, is that rather unobtrusive little shed here. It's quite true. I mean, this is, this is what's left. I find it also a curiously eloquent touch of symbolism that there's a little boy over there who's obviously just bought... Well, what is, what is that? Is that, a, is that a soldier's app that he's got? Oh, yes, that's another thing which I find rather eerie because when the wall came down, uh, a couple of days later, uh, they, they started selling these bits and pieces of the wall and they put up stands, in, in fact, on the former death strip, selling um, uniforms, caps, uh, boots, uh, medals and everything of the People's Army and, and the People's Police and the GDR. And this was all done on, on GDR territory and, and presumably even being done by the people who used to wear the uniforms, I don't know. But it, it looked very, very eerie. I mean, everything had become history and everything was up for sale. And this little boy, I mean, he's just bought something. It looks very funny. Because that's, that's how this sort of state crumbles into nothing. And that's another very funny thing to, to witness when you are here, to see that a whole state can actually fall to pieces and leave nothing behind. Course, uh, so apart from these funny souvenirs for little boys, yes, yes. <laughs> well, it, it is an eloquent comment, isn't it, on the, on, the, on, on the disappearance of a state that a little boy can walk down with what was once the, the hat of a very feared member of the, of the uniform state police yes. over there. And this and in front of the, the shed, back. which put sort of presents the horrors of the, the former dictatorship. Yeah. Nothing seems to make sense. <laughs> and I think that's, that goes for the amorphous impression this whole place makes. It doesn't seem to be a whole. It never had the stylistic unity of Paris or the, the well, chaotic, but, but rather stylish growth of London. I mean, or organic growth of London. I mean, it, it was different here. I think it, was, it grew very quickly in the 19th century. So it came out of nothing and, I mean, it was built on, on sand. It really was a kind of northern European desert it, it was built on. I mean, something you, when, when you open the, the pavement here, I mean, after about 10 centimeters, you are on sand. It doesn't look very solid. That's, that's sort of the kind of feeling I have. And mind you, German history hasn't been very solid either. Can you tell me what you're doing here? Selling rocks. And where, where have the rocks come from? Right over there. And can you tell me how you got such big pieces of rock? What did you do to get hold of them? Hold them? With a hammer and chisel. I mean, how can I tell that they're pieces of the wall? I'll show you. Here. Now, what is that at the back there? That's you pointing out something that looks a bit like a leaf pattern. That is, oh, that's where the wire was to keep the wall in place, I see. And on the other side, let's have a look at the front of it. Well, that's painted in all colours of the rainbow, isn't it? I mean, when do you think that was painted? How long ago? Well, last Friday. It was painted as recently as that, was it? Ah. I see. Mm -hmm. So you get the piece off the wall and then it gets painted? Yep. Well, I never. And how much are you selling it for? Um, eight, five, two, one. How much, how much money do you think you've made selling pieces of the wall? Okay, hundred. Hundred marks? Yeah. I'm sitting in front of a stretch of the Berlin Wall in Kreuzberg. Behind me there's a gypsy caravan with the message, if you don't believe in dreams, you aren't a realist. And in front of me there's a magnificently painted stretch of this wall. I can see a series of truly fearful wide open beast mouths with white messages in them telling one to save the earth but everybody has power. Then there's a stretch of ruinous mountain landscape with tucked behind one ruin, I see East Berlin, a picture of the television mast in East Berlin, which is falling over. And then if one looks at the top, one can see that this is signed by an artist, Indiano, and that in fact it's been painted in March 1990. 
it took a whole afternoon to locate Indiano. He lives among a collection of totem poles in the middle of a Kreuzberg farm yard, right up against the wall. I wanted to paint the wall because the people destroyed the wall and the old pictures were gone and that was my chance to start again. It's our future that I saw and I painted. The ruins we will leave if we don't stop today. How long, how long is the painting now? It must be about 50 yards, isn't it? Yeah, something more, because on Potsdamer Place I had uh, many more pictures, three pictures completely destroyed. In Kupinika Street, 12 pieces. Here on Adalbert, it's maybe 14 pieces. And all in all, it's all about 180 pieces of that wall. And when you say they're destroyed, you mean to say that you suddenly come along and find that that piece of wall has been taken away? Not completely, but they were hammering every day and I said, okay, I have to be the contrast to that. So what you're really trying to do in a strange way is that since the wall was opened, you were really trying to preserve the wall for a different purpose. I used it. I used a new time because um, all these were, what happened with the Berlin Wall was like a symbol and uh, I felt now is the point to start again. Everybody was destroying and I wanted to create. And that's my message. And what do you think the prospect is for that piece of wall that you've painted so vividly with so many striking messages on it about saving the world from its own self-destruction? What chance do you think there is for that stretch of wall to be preserved? I saw all these thousands of photographers taking the photographs and they will build up a net all over the world and a lot of people will see these photos and maybe they understand the message. Kreuzberg was always the symbol of resistance, uh, political and resistance of arts. This time is a little bit changed because they renovated all the quarters and the prices got up and a lot of people had to leave the quarter in another places. But, uh, Another part of the people is still there and working, working again. Do you predict that Kreuzberg will change in character very much now that the wall has gone? Yeah, until, until fall, we won't remember our old beloved Kreuzberg. Like Berlin itself is, is a kind of test tube. Kreuzberg is a test tube again of Berlin, where all the experiments are for, say, alternative living styles as well as alternative bread or alternative cinema or I don't know what. I mean, something which is very hard to explain to a foreigner is that there are two completely different strata of living and culture in Germany and they are easily referred to as the normal and the alternative. And you couldn't really explain by what signals I would immediately recognize someone who belongs to the alternative scene and someone who doesn't. You just know it. And in German we have the easy way of acknowledging that by referring to them with, as a do or z. So it's do if he belongs to the alternative scene and it's z if you have the feeling he doesn't. You can arrange your life in the alternative scene and thereby living in a completely different Berlin as someone who would belong to the so-called normal side or other side. You go to the alternative shops to buy your clothes. You could do everything alternatively and never meet anyone belonging to the normal side. Du sitzt mir gegenüber und schaust an mir vorbei. Ich seh dich jeden Morgen und manchmal auch um drei. Du bist immer sympathisch und manchmal eine Frau. Kreuzberg, the symbol of that alternative scene, has been a magnet for artists and writers like Bernhard Robin. Something of the heady atmosphere of the late 60s still lingers, an atmosphere celebrated in Volker Ludwig's immensely successful rock musical Linie 1, running now for four years in Berlin and named after the underground line, which ends in Kreuzberg. It's the last point of Berlin. It's short before the wall, and it's the part where the most Turks live, the most students, the, the most unemployed people, the most crazy people, the most anarchists, everybody. And when you are there at the last station, Schlesisches Tor, late afternoon, and look who comes up and down the stairs, you will have, within five minutes, all the characters of our play. But as the wall comes down, 
Kreuzberg is shifting from the margins of West Berlin towards what will be the heart of a reunified city. And without the wall, Bernhard Robben doesn't see much future for the alternative lifestyle. First of all, they lost an ideal by seeing the Stalinist developments in the East. And they had great difficulties in defining an utopia. You have a political movement in the so-called peace movement, which is so broad and so human in their aims that I think it's not really political. It's, it's nice. You can't have anything against them, but uh, there's no force behind it. So, so that, if that is the strongest movement we have, it's not a really political movement. You see that reflected in Kreuzberg. You have the hardcore, you have uh, left-wing anarchists who would go into the streets and fight for the revolution. But when I hear them or read their leaflets, I have this feeling of a kind of historical feeling. Their time is over. I don't know what will happen, but I mean, we will have to redefine so many words. If there's no communist country left, and all the countries are capitalists or becoming capitalists, so we have to define in a new dream. I mean, we need walls in a way to, to define ourselves against them. And if the wall is gone, um, we will have a problem of identification. If Kreuzberg seems to be in danger of disappearing, the center of West Berlin, around the Kurfürsten Damm, is booming. The streets are under assault from a huge flood of visitors from the east. At its heart is the Café Kranzler, a monument so important to Berliners that when it was rebuilt here after the war, it was the first sign of life in a devastated city. Walter Angres has been coming here since the 1920s. This had been, in many ways, the uh, hub of Berlin, not the government part. That was in what today is East Berlin. But uh, people came to the Kudam, which it was called already at that time, to uh, meet friends, to walk, to shop. It was the place to meet. And I think it had been to a large extent already before the First World War, when uh, the center of the street still had a riding path and people galloped along, dressed very nicely in riding attire, and very sorry that has gone. <laughs> The music, that is something that has gone by the roadside, uh, wayside, I'm afraid. Small orchestras uh, playing, and some people would go up and uh, would request certain pieces to be played, particularly if uh, you were there with your bride and you had become engaged and you wanted a certain piece to be played. I remember when I came here right after the war in 1950 uh, that uh, the houses were still for the most part in very poor repair but you had temporary houses with stores where all sorts of things were, were sold. People wanted to have a place where they could go, where they could sit, even if it was improvised. Yeah. Ein Kännchen Tee, uh, Kaffee bitte, und zwei Cappuccino. Ja, bitte. And uh, thereby the character of that area was preserved. And I think people wanted that for, uh, partly for uh, reasons that you cannot rationally explain. Uh, it was uh, probably the most rational thing would have been to tear everything down and rebuild. And then you get something like Karl Marx Straße in East Berlin, which is an awful thing. And the West Berliners did not want that. They wanted to return as far as was possible to the original 
Kultur Fürstendamm, including the trees, including the cafes, including the shops, including the whole ambience of the place. I remember that my friends, my girlfriends and I, we had pleasure in going to the Kurfürsten Damm sometimes to see the women with the, the heavy makeup. And I was a Girl Scout at that time. So I had no, no sense for making up and being unnatural. I was very natural. <laughs> and I went with my friends to the Kurfürsten Damm and laughed at the people going there. And also a housewife from Eastern Berlin came over to make a, a few groschen here and a, a few marks here when it was still out, when the wall wasn't there. And now, when the wall has fallen, German housewives from East Berlin come again, or even East Berlin prostitutes come here and make it cheaper than the other. And they are being beaten by, by the Zuhälter, by the friends of the, of, the, of the girls here. There was no feeling of uh, reuniting. <laughs> they didn't like it. Anna-Marie Weber, a well-brought-up young girl, who went on to write several books about the seamy side of Berlin. It's a side you can hardly miss in this part of the city, as the young girls with deep tans and white boots line up in the shadow of the ruined memorial church. It's curious and very significant that they left the memorial church ruined, but very quickly rebuilt the Kurfürstendamm, recreating an area dedicated to all the pleasures which cost money and make money. And it's also curious that just behind these frantic streets, there's a great stretch of green. For Berliners, the Tiergarten is as much a symbol of pleasure now as it was in the 1920s. I had an adorer, uh, admirer with me, and my admirer was kissing me on the Tiergarten bench. It was the best day of my life. I was 17 then. It is still. It is still homosexuals meet in Tiergarten and even criminal people in the night, of course, only in the night. Like the World of in, in Paris, Tiergarten has a very bad reputation in, at night. It's bad there. Ossi! 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 During the day, you're more likely to encounter a pig. In the middle of the tear garden, there's a circus. There's been one here, off and on, for over 200 years. And Irene Mussinger is the pig's trainer. The pig I trained the pig, it's the trained pig. And I had, I, when six years I went on stage with the animals. What did he do? Myself. What does a trained pig do? He rolls out a carpet, and when I tell him to make his tail straight, he makes his tail straight, and he blows on a trumpet, and he lies down and sits down. But he's very dangerous now, he's old. Pigs are not, are really dangerous. You have to treat them like well, this, this, animals. This is surely very unusual, isn't it? I mean, a pig that blows a trumpet. Well, now it's quite unusual, but pigs are, are in, in traditional circles, pigs were always trained. To make the tail straight, it's a very old trick. It's not a new one. I, I got it from a circus guy, and this is very old, that pigs make their tails tail straight, and I won't tell you how to do it. The tear garden looked very much, in my memory, the way it looks now. When I came back in 1950, there was no tear garden. It was absolutely... There were a few trees left, real big ones, which they couldn't cut down for firewood. But it was a desert. It was an absolutely horrible sight. And it came to me as a tremendous shock when I saw that because it was not destroyed by bombs, it was destroyed by Berliners who needed uh, fuel. Now the Tiergarten has recovered. Its woodlands are so dense, you can hardly see the railway track, which runs around the edge at roof height. But for the last 40 years, this was the only railway between West and East Berlin. It rattled along to Friedrichstraße, so empty that Berliners called it the ghost train. And yet this same line, links Paris and Moscow. In the 1930s, it was the escape route from Hitler's Berlin, and Anna-Marie Weber remembers other ghosts. I saw the synagogue burning in 38, 
and I went in the S-Bahn, I went to the window there, I saw it burning, other people too, we crowded at the window, then we went back to our seats and sat down and said nothing. Uh, that's the first time I say that, say that um, we, we are all cowards, uh, extreme cowards, and we thought only of ourselves. And uh, well, we can repent it now, regret it now, but we cannot alter it. I was at that time a bookseller then uh, in one of the greatest uh, bookshops of, of Berlin, and I, we had many Jewish customers. We didn't know of them that they were Jewish. Suddenly, they bought dictionaries, big dictionaries, English and French and all sorts of languages. Uh, I said, oh, yes, also he, is, he, might, he will um, emigrate. At that time, it was still possible, but many of the Jews didn't believe that it was necessary. When you arrive at Friedrichstraße, everybody has to get out and join the crowds filing through little cubicles with steel doors. This used to be a terrifying place. The people's police didn't want to let you in, and they certainly didn't want to let you out. And their faces showed it. These days, they can raise a smile as they take your West German money and stamp your visa. In the old days, when you got outside the station, you just felt relieved that you got through all those barriers. Nowadays, the tensions have gone, but there's a lot more noise. Since the war was open, the Friedrichstrasse has become one continuous traffic jam. But it was always a busy place. Sixty years ago, this was the heart of Berlin theatre land. Despite all that's happened since, people still come to Friedrichstrasse for a night out. Much of that theatre land has survived and prospered, not least because this is Bertolt Brecht's corner of East Berlin. His grubby brown stone house lies up the road from here, and Brecht's daughter, Barbara Schall, who came back to East Berlin from America with her father 40 years ago, still lives here. This is the flat left just exactly the way uh, as it was when my father lived here. There are three things, actually, that really remind me very much of my father. One is all the working surfaces. He usually had several projects in hand at one time, and they were, one play was on this uh, here, and a, a series of poems here, and he uh, sort of walked between them. He was a walking writer. The other thing is um, the picture on this wall. It's called The Doubter. He took that all over the world with him and uh, to remind him to doubt everything. And the third thing is a very small thing. My father used to read murder mysteries for relaxation. And uh, when he died, there was one open on the table next to him. And I don't visit here all that often. But when I do come, I always take it out and put it down like it was. And every time I come back, it's always been put away again discreetly so that the image of a great man will not be clouded by such frivolity. Other than that, uh, you can see flat is very simply furnished, a lot of light, and the view over the cemetery where he's lying, a famous cemetery in the Berlin with Hegel in it, Hans Eisler in it. It's, it's a lovely little wild cemetery. Room for me too. In the graveyard where Brecht is buried, it's easy to miss his grave. It's a simple piece of stone with nothing but his name. There's no date and there's no carving. He's surrounded by his friends, the composer Hans Eisler, John Hartfield, creator of the photo montage, and there's Heinrich Mann, Thomas Mann's brother, but the real memorial to Brecht is a few hundred yards down the street. It's the Theater am Schiff Bauerdamm. You can see it from a distance because there's a revolving lighted sign on top with the name Berliner Ensemble.
wenn es mal regnete und es begegnete ihnen eine neue Rasse, eine braune oder blasse, dann machten sie vielleicht auch ihr Biefsteak dann an. This was the setting for Brecht's first triumph. On the 28th of August, 1928, the Threpney Opera opened here. Friedrich Luft, the theatre critic, has been going to the theatre in Berlin for 70 years. Every staging was absolutely uh, breathtaking, and that was the beauty of it. Of course it was lavish, but he always, if something was clean and new, put over a black or a grey <laughs> gray colour and uh, uh, no, no, it wasn't, it, it was uh, proletarian all the time, but it was a proletarian beauty which he, he dressed like that too, he didn't never shave and he never washed his hair and he, he smelled badly. If you sat together with him, you always had to take him. <laughs> <laughs> Brecht was new, and Bruckner was new, and and all sorts of all, and, and well, Kaiser was still alive, and Hauptmann was still alive, and we saw his plays. It was an exciting time. It was the time of the theatre which I enjoyed most. Perhaps it was all wrong. I, mean, we, I was more interested in the theatre at that time as a comparatively young man in, than into politics. I wasn't, it wasn't didn't touch me. And I, I thought if the peace movement or anti-war anti plays and so were successful on the theatre, I thought that we had a victory. It was all right. It wasn't. On the streets, it was quite different. But perhaps the most astonishing thing about Berlin theatre is not its well-known exuberance before the war, but what happened after. It was extraordinary. It came to life suddenly, and uh, we had about 300, 300 theatres in Berlin. They were played in garages, and they were played in big pub rooms or in churches or they played in the open and they played everywhere. It was, it was, it was really silly, nothing but the people couldn't do anything else. They couldn't train because they hadn't anything in their hands and they couldn't build anything. They couldn't make a pair of shoes because they didn't get leather and, and so on. So they, most of them, or the more interesting people went into the theater. And we had four different nations here, and the Russians, that was very queer too to us, when they came in, they said it's the first, very first thing they wanted to get going again were the theatres, the few theatres that were left. And I see myself sitting in the, in the end of June in the Deutsches Theater again, and the theatre was opened, and the Russians were there, sitting there, waiting for them to, and they did a play of Schiller's, and it was tremendous, and we thought, well, now it, war is over. We've got our theaters back. And then when the Americans and the English, the British came in, and the French, they were astonished to see the whole, the whole city full of theaters, the whole city, so they had to rush back and get the old writers and get some productions here to compete with the, with the Russian sector, where the theater was terribly important and very good at that time. As soon as money was valuable again, that suddenly stopped. The people didn't go to the theater, and then people who were working on the theater were probably going into business or other businesses. It's, 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 it's a curious thing that happened there. Most of those lively little theatres in unlikely places vanished, but not all of them. <laughs> Across the road from Brecht's theatre, up four flights of stairs in an unprepossessing drab building, is East Berlin's, in fact East Germany's, most famous cabaret, the Distel. The current show launches a wholesale attack 
on the government of Erich Honecker. And the climax of the show is an eloquent admission of embarrassment about the legacy of the GDR, about the compromises and the surrenders. Ich schäme mich. I'm ashamed. <laughs> It hasn't always been as easy to be as outspoken as that. Otto Stark, director until very recently, remembers a kind of surreal dialectic between his cabaret and the powers that be. Of course, they said you have no restriction at all, but on the other hand, it was restriction. It's a double thing, a dialectic you know, process, you know what I mean? You, myself, I always looked, can I say that? Or can, I can't say that, because if I said something which wasn't right, they said always, well, we have to discuss about that, you know. And they always said, you know, who has got the better arguments is winning. Of course, uh, the politician had always the better arguments because they had also the might. So it was silly to say who has got the better arguments. And that's why we had also sometimes to take out some scenes or chansons or songs which was not uh, allowed. Wollen uns den Wohlstand bringen, dass die Sonne schön beliebt über Deutschland, 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 Professional cabarets we have got a, in this country here about 10 to 12 in the whole country. It was since the last eight or ten years. And the other one was amateur, amateur cabarets, which was about 250. But we always say we are living journalists of the stage. We are not journalists in the newspapers and journalists on the stage. And people want to see that and want to hear that. And the last 40 years it was very important because people always uh, read between the lines. That's why it was always sold out. We were sold out three years before you can have a ticket. And that, uh, the, of course, the fee at the entrance was very cheap. That you had only to pay one mark fifty, or the most expensive place was four mark fifty. That's about one pound and a half, you know. <laughs> but it's not. It's nothing at all, is it? <laughs> The distal, like any cabaret, was bound to be in conflict with the powers that be. The irony of East Berlin geography is that the powers that be reside just round the corner. On Unterdin Linden, a grand ceremonial street first laid out by Frederick the Great and added to by Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the view is blocked by two very different symbols of authority. At the eastern end, by Erich Honecker's huge glass-fronted Palace of the Republic. And at the western end, by the Kaiser's Brandenburg Gate. Well, for a short time, you used to be able to go up to the Brandenburg Gate and right underneath it. And now I see, once again, we can't, because it seems to be protected now by a kind of corrugated iron fencing. What's going on here? Well, the Brandenburg Gate has to be restored. It was in bad condition uh, after the Second World War, and its uh, condition got worse during the 28 years after the wall was built. And now uh, it's being restored. The stone, the masonry is going to be restored, and the quadriga up on the top is also being restored. It was taken out on the 23rd of March. On New Year's Eve, there were, in fact, surely hundreds of people on top of this arch, weren't there? Well, like, the p police counted 530. They only got the personal data of about 60 or 70 of them. They were climbing up there with mountain gear, and they did an awful lot of terrible things up there on the top. They were throwing bottles around and fireworks and stuff and like that. And it's presumably quite a few score of people who actually got away with a few souvenirs from the top. Well, one of the things, of course, they did is uh, they got away with mostly laurel leaves from the crown on the top of the goddess, and that was quite a problem for us, because uh, I'm on the working group of the Brandenburg Gate, and I've just come from a meeting, by the way. But one day, about a week later, a West Berlin woman came along with one of these things. She had obviously taken it from her drunken son, and uh, had pangs of conscience, of guilt, and she brought it back. And so we have one, and we're using that as a model 
it's, uh, it's certainly about seven or eight inches long and much, much larger than real life. Uh, and that's being used to uh, cut new laurel leaves. Why, why the haste? Why the urgency? Why the particular importance that attaches to restoring well, this arch? Well, the, the, the arch was in bad shape. We have a lot of sympathy to do it because of the damages which were done over New Year's Eve. It was the symbol of German division. I mean, the major thing was what Weizsäcker said once upon a time. As long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed, the German question remains open. So symbolically, when you open the gate, you answer the question. Unter den Linden was a, was a street of uh, parades and of, uh, of uh, adoring the Kaiser, adoring Hitler. You never use the Kursendamm for that. There were, there were not the people there. But Unter den Linden was really for the fatherland. Yeah? Uh, you, you could see all the splendor of the native country. And people who liked that went there, of course. And of course, whenever a war was shouted out, the emperor or Hitler showed himself on, Unter den Linden. I think when one comes here from West Berlin, it really takes your breath away because there is nothing even remotely like this in West Berlin. From where we stand here, we look across Unter den Linden and one has then got this beautiful line of statues at roof level. You've got buildings, some straight, some coming out and in in a baroque sort of way, but the whole thing is a kind of composition, architectural composition, which is quite, quite overwhelming. Well, it, it was well planned. As you see here, the two courtyards or the courtyards of the buildings of the Humboldt University are exactly parallel to the courtyards on the other side, which are two different buildings. You have the Komoda, the, the State Library, the former Royal Library, and the Opera House. Grand, uh, for grand music, uh, Richard Strauss was once upon a time the general music director of that Opera House. And you have set in back the Catholic Church, the only Catholic cathedral uh, in uh, Prussia. Well, one keeps coming back, or at least I do, to the beautiful uniformity of this part of the Unter den Linden, but there's also no getting round the fact that it plainly is full of evidence of change. After all, we've just passed a shop window, which up till very recently was just curtained. Now the silk curtains have gone, and we've got a spectacular window display of Japanese motorcycles. That is very recent change. But then, I mean, if you look in the other direction, one sees that great wall of glass. The Palace de la Republique, the Palace of the Republic, that is the Parliament of East Germany. Until the 18th of March, it was nothing else but what they call the rubber stamp. The deputies met once a month to sort of rubber stamp the decisions that were taken in the Politburo. It was put up in 1976, and it's a terrible monstrosity. You have to know what was there before. That was the site of the royal castle, the castle which existed until 1951. One thing that I greatly regret was the disappearance of the Alte Schloss Unter Linden, the castle, the uh, royal castle, which uh, was uh, needlessly torn down uh, by the East German government after the war, uh, when they were still trying to eradicate uh, all sorts of traces of the so-called imperial period. Uh, I liked that castle, and I remember there was a famous corner window where old William I used to stand, which I had in my school book. And I, I like to go there and try to visualize as a child how it must, what it must have been like to watch the old man with his beard stand in the window and look out on the linden. It was gone. Where we're standing, there's a great deal of scaffolding covering the front of the Humboldt University. And what I also notice is that it's very rusty scaffolding. So I have the impression it's been up there a long time. And I just wonder how urgent it is that they get down to repairing this and some of the other buildings around here. Well, the problems are that most of the workers who are involved in projects like this have probably left for West Germany, where the wages are twice, three, four times as high as they were here. I was just at the Neue Museum, which is being rebuilt. But until from 1945 to 1985, the building had been given up. It was supposed to be torn down. That is, left to the elements. There were trees growing out of the roof and everything is like that. They hadn't even done it anything to secure the building as a ruin. And just all of a sudden, 1985, it was decided that the building would not be given up, it would be restored. And that happened politically here for many, many buildings. They were just... Uh, thrown away, as it were. So in one sense, we've got to count ourselves very fortunate that at least the centre of Unter den Linden, where the Humboldt University faces the Opera House, that really the buildings do look as if they've been taken care of. But of course, if one's looking for signs of activity, I suppose, since the war, signs where the 
East German government really put millions into creating a cityscape, then we would have to go, presumably, to the Alexander plants. Well, they certainly did an awful lot to ruin that place with new buildings, a huge hotel, the Stadt Berlin. And of course, they had no sense of squares and they had no sense of green. There were no trees in Alexander Platz, not a single tree there to break the wind, to break the monotony of seven or eight lane streets, which don't have any that kind of traffic on it. And the buildings are very monotonous and they were put up in a jury built way. To me, I mean, the thing that strikes me is that it, it, it's so empty and bleak that it's almost guaranteed to make even a crowd of 100,000 people feel lonely. Well, it's a monstrosity and there's no excuse for it. And one can only hope that one of these days when they get finally tired of it and the government gets around to doing some other things and there's money in surplus there, that they will get around to rectifying all these problems. We were afraid of, of Alexanderplatz especially. The crowd of people hastening, they always were in a hurry. And of course they had not enough to eat. It was, the misery in Berlin was great. On the streets you saw the fights between the Nazis and the communists and the socialists against the Democrats and so on. They were shooting, they were, it was dangerous, it was, it was a Bürger Krieg. it was absolutely civil war. That was a terrible, terrible time, that was 1932 and so on and the people dropping down on the street and uh, trying to get up again and you help them. And it was ghastly. It's a strange irony that if you come down from the windswept Stalinist wastes of the Alexanderplatz down into the underground, you quite literally find underground art. The underground station is hung with large paintings which for a long time had to remain in store their subject is revolution in all its aspects and now in fact since the change in this country they have in fact officially been allowed and they now decorate the entire station i'm standing in front of one picture which is particularly vivid in the front of it in white there's a broken down wall and behind it is a huge brown mound and in that mound there are scores of different objects different symbols Und dieses Bild ist für uns hier immer noch sehr aktuell. Es hat sich nämlich noch nichts geändert. This picture here is still very topical for all of us. Nothing's changed. The same people are still doing all the talking and the ordinary folk don't get a look in. To me it's a picture showing absolute chaos and persecution. Unsere Stasi. The Stasi were always watching and listening. That's what that ear with an aerial stuck in it means. All that used to happen here. And people were muzzled. Like that man with a cage on his mouth. It's significant that these revolutionary paintings should be on this particular underground platform because it's from here that we take a train to Prenzlauer Berg. Sometimes in the summer when you walk the streets, you see people you would never see in other areas of East Berlin. You know, you would see more people, no, punk people, even skins, heavy metal, groofies, and all these people. You walk around here in little groups, they sit in the little places, even if there aren't enough places, but they will find them. There are a lot of secrets in Prenzlauer Berg. There are a lot of backyard apartments which turn out to be little galleries or little places where people meet where you can stay over at night if you know the right people. There is no green, everything is dirty, but still you always see people on the street. And in the other areas, everything is dead. You know, people get upstairs, they sit in the apartments, uh, they have TV and that's it. Despite her accent, Irina Runge is an East Berliner and very much at home in Prenzlauer Berg. Prenzlauer Berg is a good place to end this journey through a chaotic, changing city. At first sight, it merely looks run down. Long, high terraces with peeling facades that haven't seen paint for half a century. It's something of a miracle that it's all still standing. But this crumbling rabbit warren of a place 
became a magnet for some of the most creative young artists and writers in the GDR. One of their acknowledged leaders is the poet Bert Papenfuss. He lives four floors up in an almost empty room behind one of those peeling facades. I was born in North Germany, near the Baltic Sea. I couldn't develop in this uh, area, so I had to go to Berlin, because uh, Berlin was also close to West Berlin, and uh, you could meet a lot of people from West Berlin or from many Western countries. The exchange was better than in other parts of the country. Here it was possible to squat the flats, and uh, there were flats enough, and uh, that's why people came to Prenzlauer Berg. Papenfuss's poetry is an experiment with language and the ways language and drawing can work together. Working together through multimedia performances in cellar theatres or churches has always been at the heart of what was going on in the Prenzlauer Berg. We used to come together and to work together, and we used the word we. When I talk about uh, any project we uh, made, uh, I use the we. We did something together, and uh, this is different in Western countries. They say, I make a film, or I work together with other people, but not we. Maybe those things that happened in the so-called uh, underground were the experiment of uh, socialism. Bert Papenfuss is proud of this experiment with socialism, but doesn't hold out much hope that it can continue in the future. As for Irene Runge, She's enthusiastic about the prospect of a westernized, gentrified Prenzlauer Berg with brand new cafes and cleaned up streets. I think we have so much past that um, it's not necessary to, to have an artificial you know, ruin. We still have enough leftovers from the war. You see, look at the houses in my neighborhood. I mean, they're so destroyed still and you have the bullet holes still in different houses. So people live with that. People who live here, you know, and it's their life, I think they're fed up. That's why they really want, they want it to look like West Berlin. They want it to be clean. They want it to be nice. They don't want to pay the price. The price may not just be financial or even political. From Kreuzberg in the West to Prenzlauer Berg in the East, all sorts of identities are disappearing as two halves, each with a distinct past and a distinct present, are enthusiastically knocked together. Travelling through the city, it's almost as if you can hear the echoes of those wall woodpeckers on the Potsdamer Platz, destroying every day one little bit of the Berlin Wall. The risk is that in the enthusiasm of the moment, connections with the past will vanish as well. And Peter Stein, certainly the most important figure in Berlin theatre since Bertolt Brecht, knows how tragic that loss might be. The big problem of uh, the Germans and their culture and their identity is that by the destroying of the inner city, of all the, the cities in, in Germany, uh, not only the big ones, also the small ones, it is clear that the, after the war, the German people lived in a situation really, really dramatically apt for losing identity and giving up uh, identity and losing orientation. Instead of, of uh, historic centers, we have just the shit. We have concrete, we have the baddest taste and the baddest uh, forms of the Americanized the Western civilization that you can imagine. And this is especially important for, for a younger generation because you learn not only by your head, you learn with your feet, you learn with your eyes, with your feeling in a city and so on. And therefore, if it uh, happens that the remaining parts, the remaining elements of Berlin who is the youngest capital in all, uh, whole Europe, that these parts, the remaining parts of Berlin, they are preserved and uh, reconstructed in a certain way and, and uh, re-accepted um, as uh, elements of the city identity of, of that town that will have a good effect on the people living in there by um, uh, getting that in a kind of, of uh, visible memory in stone and streets and the city structure. It will help at least the, the Berlin population uh, to feel better with themselves. And this, I think, is something that is very important or for, also for, for other people in, in Europe, that the Germans feel quite well with themselves.
Signposts and Souvenirs, a personal journey through Berlin by Philip Brady, and he'll be cropping up on other occasions during this Berlin weekend. Now, for the last five weeks, Radio 3 has been exploring the musical achievements of Herbert von Karajan. In this, the sixth programme, in his series The Consummate Conductor, Richard Osborne appropriately finds his subject close to that well-known wall and with a certain orchestra rehearsing. <laughs> Weg mit dieser grauenhaften Dida da, Dida da, Dida da, Spiel doch mal eine Phrase in, die ganze Phrase in ein Verhalten, aber mit einer ungeheuren Leidenschaft. Spiel mal fortissimo. Eins, zwei, zwei, zwei. You have seen me conducting a rehearsal. This is a completely different attitude. I mean, in a, in a rehearsal, you have to be with a sort of microscopic mind. Mind and a microscopic ear. You have to hear the faults which are played. And the less personal engagement you put in, the better. Because the fault will come out in itself. You see, it's like if you jump on horseback, you don't carry the, the, the horse over the obstacle. You place the horse in a position that it will do the natural thing and jump. And the better you place it and more precise it is on this, it will do the same. If you try to help an orchestra in the rehearsal, they will rely that you help them in a concert, and they should not. Because this is a, a basic principle, and I, I spend a good 10 or 15 years in conducting to learn it, that if you, so to say, carry the thing, then they will be lazy. In a, in a rehearsal, you don't have to make a, a, a sign for a photo. The photo is written. And if they don't play, you say, gentlemen, it's not right. You, you must play a photo. And then the orchestra will carry you. And this is the important thing. The idea of Karajan being carried by an orchestra rather than dictating to it may seem rather strange. After all, to judge by what's been written about him in the press over the years, it seemed to be the very model of a modern martinet. Last week I went to Berlin to meet members of the Berlin Philharmonic, and what emerged from talking to them was that Karajan the musical empire builder was a rather different creature from Karajan the working musician. This was evident even to players who joined the orchestra in the politically troubled later years of Karajan's reign. The oboist Hans-Jörg Schellenberger, for instance, who first played for him in 1977. In the moment when he was partner of an orchestra with us, he gave you freedom as much as you wanted. Of course he told you in a rehearsal if he had some other idea about the solo which he wanted to play. But he said it just once. And when you, when you got it, which he needed to have a person opposite who really got it in the first moment, then he, let you, he left you out. He could, you could do what you wanted because you felt in an instant what he wanted in the music and what you can bring in. But it was something which you brought in yourself. It was not brought in by tension from him. He was not a conductor who gave you tension. He was a conductor who gave you the, the, the feeling that you're sharing an uh, artistic moment of making music together. This was really a part of how he behaved sometimes outside of the stage. Because there he was the dictator, it's no question. But within the music, his dictatorship came from, I mean, it's a positive dictatorship, came from the absolutely strong mind of what he wanted to do as a musician. And he could show this in an instant. It's often said that both Karajan and the orchestra were at their best in romantic or late romantic repertory. Still, unless you really are a fully paid up member of the period instrument lobby, there's a lot of pleasure to be derived from Berlin Philharmonic Mozart, whether the conductors Furtwängler or Bruno Walter, Joachim or Karajan. Here they are with Karajan in a wonderfully ceremonious 1977 recording of the Hafner Symphony, the playing are bane and full-bodied, the reading passionate but precise. <laughs> 